hear me carefully on this. The cross does not save you. The cross never was your salvation. Here's why I say this. What we say is that Christ's perfect sacrifice is what saved us. You see, he chose the cross, but it was the death that, sa that saved us. It was not the cross. I've been asking myself all this week, why a cross? We teach our kids this way. We've, we've said it from our pulpits this way. We, we talk about the wages of sin, Romans 3. We talk about the wages of sin. It's death. And then we say, so because we sin, death enters the world. And sometimes we even say it, and, and it's, it's very debased, uh, very bohemian. Uh, we, say, um, we say, well, death is required because of sin. That's not how this works, first of all. Uh, death is a consequence. It's not God requiring it of us. It is a consequence of being separate from God. God is life. Sin separates us from God. As a consequence, we die. God doesn't say, uh, you sinned, therefore I'm going to kill you. He never says that, never. But we say these things, and we quote these verses, and we say, well, the wages of sin is death, and we say, therefore, Jesus needed to die on a cross. How did we get there? Why a cross? You see, it was his death that redeemed us. Said a different way, of course, we, this stretches us a little bit, but what if Jesus, as a sinless person, a, the God-man that he is, notice I didn't say was, he still is the God-man. So what if Jesus, as the God-man that he is, come to earth, incarnated in our midst, living a sinless life, what if he died of cancer? What if he died in a chariot accident? They didn't have car accidents. <laughs> what, if, what if he had a construction accident? What if he had been stoned to death? What if he had died when they were striking him with those 40 lashes minus one with the cat of nine tails? Some did. What if he had died then? You see, we've never explained how we got to the cross. And here's the important thing you need to know is God, God although he knew the cross was coming, it was, not, it was not the cross that saved us, but Christ himself still chose the cross. Why did he choose a cross out of all of the ways he could have died for our sins? Why did he choose a cross? You ever ask yourself the question? Some of you are like, no. I just always assumed that that was right. We put these images around the church, and rightfully so. We love the cross, and rightfully so. I, I'm not convinced that we should polish up the cross and make it as pretty as it is. I'm not convinced it should always be a piece of jewelry or a lucky charm. Um, that'd be tantamount to putting a, a noose around our necks or hanging a noose on our walls. I don't think we should beautify it. I think we should be reminded of the starkness of the cross. But why the cross? And here's what you need to know about the cross. While Christ chose it, he chose it precisely because it represents the worst of us. It represents the worst of us. Crucifixion is still, historically speaking, considered one of the worst deaths. It was invented some 700 years before the time of Christ in the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians, um, Xerxes, Artaxerxes that you read about in the book of, of Daniel, and then later um, you'll, you'll read about him in, in, in the prophets Ezra and Nehemiah, or, right? This, this, or Esther, right? This, this Xerxes, um, this, this Assyrian Empire was the empire that invented crucifixion, but it looked different. You see, what the Romans did was they took what the Assyrians had invented and they perfected it. Did you know most crucifixions, I, I don't know if most, but a good portion of crucifixions were not done using nails. 
like a, an alarming statistic. We think of crucifixion and we think automatically of nails, but an alarming statistic of crucifixions were done just by tying you on the cross. That was death. Of course, there was uh, the exposure to the elements. There was the dehydration. There was all of that. But, uh, but as your body failed, as you extended, your weight extended against your outstretched arms that were lashed and tied to the cross beam, your lungs would begin to fill up with fluid. The pericardial line around your heart would begin to fill up with fluid and every heart would be would become more labored every breath would become uh, would become less efficient until finally either by heart attack or by drowning in your own fluids you would just finally die that was crucifixion the nails were an added thing we took what was a horrendous death and we made it worse you see, the cross represents humanity's worst. Jesus, in choosing the cross, chose us at our worst. Hear that. He chose us at our worst. He chose us in the depths of our depravity. He chose the very thing that represented the worst of what we are. Isn't it amazing that we would hang this on our walls and call this thing a redemptive icon? We do, and rightfully so. But then we ignore the implications of the cross itself. And we build up our walls that keep us away from the worst of society. <laughs> Yet our very symbol reminds us that Christ saved us at our worst. <laughs> There's an irony there that we dare not lose. So why the cross? Why nails? I was thinking about this. Why the nails? I was going to demonstrate this with a, a hammer, an 18-ounce hammer. I've got a 20-ounce hammer but my, my arms and a 24-ounce hammer. My arms are way too skinny for that nonsense. Um, and I was going to bring up these two pieces of wood, and I was going to drive these, uh, these 16 penny nails, and it was going to be great, but I knew, I knew, I knew I'd miss, I'd hit a thumb, I'd give glory to God publicly. You know, I knew this would happen. I'd bend the nail over, or someone would be, uh, Charlie would be sitting there who makes a profession of this, and he'd be going, I'm never hiring that kid. You know, it took, him, it took him a long time to get that nail driven. Um, so I decided not to do this, but here's the point. I, why a nail? You know what a nail does? It binds two things together that are otherwise not together. That's its job. That's the one thing it accomplishes. And sometimes I use it to pick food out from my teeth. Um, but uh, I remember we were doing the siding project over, uh, uh, over at the Clytes Church, the senior Clytes Church, and um, Dave Thrush and I were on the scaffolding, and, and um, Dave, I needed some nails. Dave handed me some nails. I popped those nails in my mouth to hold them, and after they were in my mouth, he informed me that those nails had also been in his mouth, <laughs> and he called us spit buddies after that. <laughs> And I've never quite shaken that. But, but what does the nail do? Here, here's siding. Here's what si siding is very different than the structure of the building, right? We were putting up vinyl siding. It's different. It's two different things being, coming together because of a nail. Understand this. Here is the worst of humanity. And here is the best of heaven. And God's redemption comes by nailing them together. The worst of who you are has been nailed to the righteousness of Christ. So let me give you a salvation message in my introduction. Here it is. Here it is. However bad you've been, however far you've gone, whatever darkness has entrenched your life, God chose you in the worst of our moments. He chose me. He chose me in the worst of my moments. I don't often give my testimony, 
because I've heard so many people give testimonies and it sounds as if they are glorifying a previous life and, and talking about the things that they did and the craziness that they went on. They tell it with a laugh and a wink and a nudge. And then they say, and then Jesus saved me. And it's like, what did he save you from? It sounded like you were having a great time. And I don't often give my testimony because I've heard that testimony and it's stupid. Let me tell you, I was a mess. I was a mess. I was suicidal. I was lost in, in the mess of drugs and addiction. I was lost in it. I had nowhere to go. And the bottom kept being redefined. I kept looking for a new bottom. And I remember my parents had left town and so much of what was plaguing me was an issue of forgiveness in my life. I refused to forgive. I have a sister with a very broken relationship, she and I, and really she and the whole family. And there were wounds that I felt I had borne that could never be forgiven. And so instead of forgiving those wounds, I chose instead to medicate those wounds. And it wasn't working. And at one point, I came home late in the night. And my parents met me at the door. Um, and they called me out. And I punched my dad. And I moved out <laughs> that night. I was kicked out. <laughs> had it coming and I went back some weeks later to talk to my dad and I I went in to his office and he was talking I thought he was on the phone so I was gonna just walk away and I remember looking around the corner and he wasn't on the phone he was knelt down at his, at his office chair praying. And I was so disgusted. I was so lost. It disgusted me. I thought every Christian was, thought every Christian was, uh, was a hypocrite. I thought they were all deluded. Honestly, I thought they were all stupid for believing something so foolish. Um, and so very disgusted. I, I turned to walk away. He never knew I was there, and I heard him pray my name. Oh, it made me so mad, <laughs> but I couldn't shake it, and weeks passed. It always has taken me a long time. <laughs> I've always had to learn the hard way. Weeks passed. They had left town, and I was at their house, not because I had a key, but because I knew how to get into their house, and they were gone. And I was low on resources. I went to rob my parents. <laughs> and I was in their house, and the phone rang, and I saw on the caller ID it was my sister, who at the time lived in Hawaii. So some four or five hours difference, I can't remember. And uh, so I answered. And we started talking about the mess of my life. And I'm not sure what happened, except that all I know is while I was sitting in a lazy boy recliner, in my dad's lazy boy recliner, she says to me, well, you dummy, there's only one thing left to do. She says, what are you hanging on to? I said, I don't know. But I, whatever, and I, here's what I said, but whatever it is, I want it. She says, well, it's going to kill you. And it was. It was killing me. I prayed a prayer. Prayers are great. Moments of prayer, a sinner's prayer, that's great. The prayer itself is not what saved me any more than the cross is what saved me. You see, in that moment, what saved me was the righteousness of Christ being nailed to the depravity of my life. That's what saved me. I wish I could tell you that in that moment, every unrighteousness disappeared in my life. 
I wish I could tell you some years later when, when I, 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 I experienced what we would call entire sanctification. I wish I could tell you every element of that cross disappeared in my life. It did not. It did not. Here's what I can tell you. is that the righteousness of Christ that was nailed to my life began to transform the wickedness of that life into something that is redeemed. That's what the cross is. That's why we hang it on our walls. Not, not because it's an instrument of death, not because it saves us, but because it reminds us that God takes the wickedness, the perversity, the worst of humanity and redeems it into something new entirely. This is the hope that we have. Why the cross? Why the nails? Because Jesus chose us at our worst. So thankful for that. Now, in the midst of it, I'll be honest with you, in the midst of it, sometimes you begin to feel alone, don't you? Isn't it good to know sometimes Jesus felt alone? You're like, well, he had the Spirit of God, yeah, he was Jesus. And still he cried out on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Today we're going to read that. It's a lament. I don't know if you knew this, but Jesus was quoting scripture from the cross. It's Psalm 22, and it's the first line of the psalm. We'll talk some about this in a few minutes. I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 22. It's right there, if that helps. I had a bookmark there, so um, it's on page 656. But um, as you turn there this morning, keep it open. It's a long psalm. We're going to read it as the sermon itself progresses. But um, here's how we're going to work through this passage. We're going to look at it in terms of three different nails. Three different nails. Because they pierced his hands, right hand, left hand, and his feet. Three different nails. And we're going to find as we traverse this scripture, as we, as we move through this lament, we're going to find those things that have been nailed to the wickedness of our depravity by the righteousness of God. And in there, my prayer for you is that you find that redemption story that belongs to you. That victory story that belongs to you. We've been singing about overcoming and we've been singing about the victory in Christ. And I'll be honest, again, I've spoken this often to you. There are days when I feel like Jesus, not very victorious. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's why we go to these stories because sometimes we come into our churches and we sing about victory and overcoming and we have the great moving of the Spirit and we think we can accomplish anything and then we step out of here and we fail everything. <laughs> and it's good for us to see that even Christ, filled by the Spirit and sinless, had moments when he felt like his Father had forgotten him. So we come to this. It is a lament. It's a lament. Again, we're going to look at this in terms of three nails. I'm going to put key verses on the, pe on the, uh, the, uh, the screen, but I'm going to read the entire portion. So this first portion comes from the first 11 verses of Psalm 22. Hear the word of the Lord. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? The words of my groanings. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy. Enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you, our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. And in you they trusted and they were not put to shame. But I'm a worm, not a man, scorned by humanity and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make their mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him, let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, 
and there is none to help. So here it is. Trouble is near, and there is none to help. You ever felt that way? And God, where are you in the midst of this? It's this moment of feeling forsaken. It's this moment when it seems like God is so far away. Jesus cried out these words. He said it in the Aramaic. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Um, the people that were hearing him didn't understand what he was saying, and they thought he was calling Elijah down. No. No, he was quoting scripture. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Oh, and we take those words, and I think sometimes we assign too much meaning to them when we say, well, God the Father turned his back on his son. You've got, we're going to read the rest of the psalm. God the Father never turns his back on anyone. He rejects the sin, not the sinner. And this is what happens. But here's Jesus in the midst of the agony with the nails. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Bound to the wickedness of humanity. And here's what you need to know. In the midst of your forsakenness, in the midst uh, of, of this moment when Christ himself felt forsaken, is that the time of trial is when God draws nearest to us. The sufferings of the nail bind us to him and him to us. You see, it is in the trial that God draws especially close. You're like, I don't feel it. It's because sometimes the pain is so great. It really is. But there's moments. I remember, I think I've shared this story before. I've shared so many stories, I can't ever remember what I've told you and what I haven't. And so I just start making up new things when I shoot my kids with Nerf guns. That's how I get stories. Um, and so I, I set them up for stories so I can get new ones, but this one's an old one. Um, my first heart surgery I woke up in the middle of. Um, can I just say that's not a pleasant experience? <laughs> I, remember, I remember in the fog of it, I remember hearing the doctor say, He's stirring. You've got to keep him still. You have got to keep him still. He wasn't talking to me. I remember feeling them inside my heart. I wish I could describe that, but I remember that feeling. And I remember all these hands pinning me down. And I remember the pain. But to this day, oh, and it gets me every time. To this day, what I remember the most in the fog of it before they were able to sedate me again was a nurse who was sitting at my head. I never saw her face. But she leaned over just, just enough where I could see the, uh, the cafeteria hat she was wearing. Um, that's the only time I ever see those hats is in cafeteria, and, and uh, still I get hair in my food. Um, but I remember seeing that, that puffy hat, and she was stroking the top of my head. She says, you're doing great. You're doing so good. You're going to be fine. Uh, give us just a few more seconds. Just hang on. And she was so calm, and she was so right there, and she was so reassuring. She was so close. I think today, though, I would never be able to recognize her face if I heard her voice. I'd know it. And this is the way God comes to us in those moments of, of, of agony and pain and sorrow and suffering, and all we're aware of are, are the events of our life. And it seems like in the events of our life, God is far away, but then he comes in at those moments, those precious moments, and he just says, oh, you're doing great. Just, just hang in there just a little bit longer. This is going to hurt a little bit. And, 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 and I can't do anything about that right now, but you're doing great. And I'm going to get you through this. God draws so close in the sorrow. Even when we feel forsaken, we are not. We are not. Here's the second nail. It's forgiveness. Then it, isn't it amazing that Christ, when he, when he was nailed to the cross, when he was nailed to the cross, said, Father, forgive them. I don't know if you've had anyone ever put a nail through your hand. My father-in-law has. Thankfully, it was not me. It was my brother-in-law with a nail gun. And it was a glorious moment. 
<laughs> and we were going to the ER, and he's got this thing through, uh, through his hand, and um, his name's Dennis. I started calling him St. Dennis, and he's like, why are you calling me? He was not in the mood for joking. Um, he said, why are you calling me St. Dennis? I said, because you're bearing the mark of the stigmata. <laughs> and I said, it's a sacred thing. And he was not humored, right? And, and, and Dana's brother, Dan, that shot the, the gun, um, he kept saying, Dad, I'm so sorry. And finally, Dennis says, it's okay, but we knew it wasn't, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and it's this moment that it's like, Yes, I forgive you. Yes, all of these things. But the reality is the fact that he did it when the nails were driven into his hand is profound. Father, forgive them. Here's our wickedness on display. Here's the nails that make it so much worse. This belongs to humanity. God the Father did not kill the Son. We did. We did. And we did it in the worst possible way. And here he is with the nails, with the cross. And he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Hear these words from Psalm 22, beginning with verse 12. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a raven, a raven and roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my chest. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to my jaws. And you lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. See if this sounds familiar, church. Do you know this was written a thousand years before crucifixion was invented? Hear these words. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and they gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and my for my clothing they cast lots. Do you hear this? Do you remember what was happening at the foot of the cross? Jesus had a garment that had been woven from, uh, in one thread from, top, uh, from bottom to top. It, was, it, it wasn't a seamed garment. It was an, an expensive robe. We're not sure how he got it, but this was a costly thing for sure. And, and so here were the Roman soldiers. Jesus is hanging naked and exposed. He's going to die. They're saying he has no need of this. So they're, they're casting lots for his garments while he hangs crucified by nails. Isn't this interesting that the psalmist should talk about this? You see, there's something going on here that we often miss when we come to this psalm. Uh, when, we, we, when we hear it coming out of Jesus' words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We go, what does that mean that God forsook Jesus, that God turned his head? What, is, what does that mean? There's something else going on. You see, in Jesus' day, they didn't have chapter headings. They didn't have chapters and verses like what we have. So the way that they would refer to a passage was by saying its first line. So if you go to Genesis in the Hebrew, they would say, and they're, they're wanting you to know they're speaking out of Genesis. In the Hebrew, they'd say barashit, which means in the beginning. Um, if, if you went to um, a particular passage, um, if, if we would go to Psalm 23, they would say, the Lord is my shepherd. What they're saying is Psalm 23, or on and on and on. That's how they would refer to the passages. Do you see what's going on? Here's this passage that's talking about Jesus' garments or these garments being cast for lots. The dogs, you remember what Jews called Gentiles? Call them dogs. Most of us are dogs in the room. Who let the dogs out? I, I don't know. Um, I've been asking for years now, um, but the dogs encircle me, the mockers encircle me, they're casting lots for my garments, uh, my hands uh, are pierced, my feet are pierced, you see what's going on, the Pharisees who knew the law of the Lord, who knew the scriptures are standing there, and Jesus from the cross with forgiveness in his voice says to the onlookers, hey guys, Psalm 22, check it out, they knew. They knew. He's saying all of this, and what he was saying was, all of this has a plan, and part of this plan is uh, this on purpose is your forgiveness. 
Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You see, we can't surprise God. <laughs> Isn't that good to know? You can't surprise God. As we were hiding in all nooks and crannies of the church yesterday, I made it my life's ambition to surprise people. I wanted some little third grader to wet himself. <laughs> that was going to be my glory and my crown. Um, Right, that I jumped out and I was shooting people and I got shot and it was glorious. Um, but, but, but God is never surprised. You can't surprise God. We see this written so many years earlier, Jesus now pronouncing it. And all of this was for a plan. And the plan was so that you would get this message. God, I, God forgive them for they know not what they do. God's answer is yes. I've said this to you. I pray you hear this. Some of you are thinking you need to ask and beg God for forgiveness. He has already given it to you. You do not need to ask him for forgiveness. You need to receive the forgiveness that he's already given. <laughs> Isn't that great? There's no begging. There's no pleading. He's already said, yes, I forgive you. Would you please accept it? I died. I went through this so that you would know I forgive you. What a profanity to hear these words and then to reject it. The time of trial is the time when forgiveness is proffered. We are either bound to the cross where forgiveness is given and received, or we are bound to the mockers who refuse to hear his cry of, Father, forgive them. And just like the garments, when we divide within the body of Christ, when we cast lots and we poke and we mock, when we divide within the body of Christ, just like the onlookers, we are mutilating the divine flesh all over again. When we poke at each other, we are the body of Christ. And when we hurt and we maim and we wound, we are doing it to Christ. And church, we have got to stop putting Christ on the cross. This is why we celebrate in the Protestant tradition a crucifix without Christ. We say, well, Christ is not on the cross. And then we sit in our pews and we prove ourselves wrong because we put him there again and again and again. When we divide in the church, we are mutilating the body of Christ all over again. But he has forgiven us. Here's the last nail. We have been formed even reformed. Hear this, the cross is not uh, the cross is not transactional. It is transformational. It is not some divine transaction an exchange of goods for services. It is not a transaction. He paid the penalty of sin, but that penalty of sin is not some kind of transaction, a tit for tat not what this is. It is transformational. It, the, the, the implication of the cross is not, it is not so, that, so that we could have um, this bought and paid for, though that is done. The issue of the cross is so that the wickedness would be transformed into righteousness. That's, that's the point of it. Here's what it says in Psalm 22, picking up with verse 22. He says, I will tell of your name to my brothers. You see, there's a transformed life. My God, my God, this, remember where we started? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yet now here we are in verse 22. Now I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel, for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction or the afflicted. Oh, hear this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What does it mean that God the Father turned his back on the Son? Listen to this. The very psalm that Jesus was quoting says, For he has not despised and abhorred the afflicted or the affliction. Hmm. That's good news today. And he has not hidden his face from him, but he has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the con great congregation. Do you get this? If you can't praise today, it's because you don't know Christ. Where does praise come from? We think our praise and our worship is what we do. It's a gift given to us by God. We respond to God. 
Do you see this? This is profound because, because, because so many of us have made praise and worship this thing that we do. I do it. I do it. I do it. We've taken control of something that doesn't belong to us. It is the Spirit of God in, it, in us doing it. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied, and those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. Now all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord. This is the same Lord who's on a cross. Kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. Now all the prosperous of the earth eat and worship before him uh, shall bow all who go down to the dust even the one who cannot keep himself alive anybody managed to do that most of you today have managed to keep yourself alive for a day but give yourself another 70 years i doubt that will be the case um, uh, posterity shall serve him it shall be told of the lord to the coming generation they shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn for he has done it he has done it and here it is he has formed he uh, the cross itself is transformational it is the wickedness of christ being nailed to the righteousness of christ so that the wickedness of humanity can become the righteousness of god it's this great exchange that happens between heaven and earth this is this is what happens when god's righteousness is nailed to humanity's wickedness this is what happens when Christ is nailed to our lives. The cross of Christ transforms the nature of the cross and the nature of humanity's depravity by nailing righteousness to it. Notice, he condemns it by becoming the condemnation himself. We see it in Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. By becoming the curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Or from John 3, 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But in order that the world through him might be saved. And then here in Romans 8, 1 through 4. You've got to read these words. There is therefore now, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, that's us, and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Notice, it's not saying he condemned your sin in your flesh. He's saying he condemned sin by becoming the curse and by being nailed to it. He became the curse and he condemned sin in the flesh by condemning himself on the cross. Verse 4, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Whew. The cross is not God's wrath upon humanity. God is not ticked off at you. It is humanity's perversity upon God's love. God's love is wrath. But God's wrath is a ferocious love that seeks to destroy the perversity by making the profane righteous. Whew. The cross is not Christ's way of getting God to love us. It is God's way of letting us know that we are loved. So here we are, the nails that have bound us to the righteousness of Christ, the body that was broken, the blood that was shed. You say, Pastor, what is the big deal with the cross? The big deal with the cross is the righteousness that you, that you become by being nailed to Christ. We become something new. The perversity of humanity fades and the glory of heaven comes. This is what happens when we eat this holy communion together. This is this sacrament that nourishes our body. Hear these words, the communion supper, which was instituted by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is a sacrament which proclaims his life. It proclaims his suffering, his sacrificial death, and his resurrection and the hope of his coming again. It shows forth the Lord's death until his return. This supper is a means of grace. It's a means of grace.